So hi, everyone. We're really excited to have you here. I see a lot of people are still joining. And we're super excited and very honored and lucky to have Ellen Hildebrand with us. She is a New York Times bestselling author and amazing alumna of Johns Hopkins University and is excited to be here with us too. So we've been chit chatting. I think as you've joined us, you've been listening to us talk. And if you have questions, um, I've gotten a lot of questions from you guys before we started and I've shared them with Ellen. And uh, there's also a Q&A feature to Zoom. If you wanna ask a question, you can ask it in the Q&A. You can text me. Um, I'll put my uh, number in the chat if you guys wanna text me or you can email me. I'll be uh, sort of running things while Ellen talks to us um, and answers some of our questions. So without further ado, welcome and thank you so much. You're so welcome. Um, hi, Hopkins people. Please give a shout out if you went to college with me. I graduated in 1991. Uh, so I was started in September of 87 and graduated in May of 91. So I've been out for almost 29 years. But if you went to college with me, give a shout. Um, I'm very excited to do this. I'm going to give a little bit of a, a talk. I do 40 speaking events per year. So I'm going to give my standard talk. It's about <clears throat> 10, 12 minutes about how I got to where I am. And then I'll give a very brief description um, of my new book, and then we can get into questions and uh, hopefully make this more of a dialogue. Um, I do wanna start by saying that there are a lot of heroes at Johns Hopkins this month on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. I am not one of them, but if you are a healthcare provider, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, so anyway, my, my best summertime memories, um, were had with my blended family. It was my father, my stepmother and five kids. And the summer after my stepfather and my father and stepmother got married, they started taking the five of us to Brewster in Cape Cod for the month of July. And we rented the sort of ramshackle funky cottage um on a sandy lane that led to the beach and we had all these rules that we had to abide by in the summertime we were not allowed to shower inside we had to use the outdoor shower we were not allowed to eat inside we had to take breakfast lunch and dinner on the deck on the patio at the picnic table if it was sunny it was a beach day and right after breakfast the five of us would sort of sling our towels around our necks march down to the beach my parents would slather us with copper tone number four that was a foam and we would spend eight or nine hours at the beach we would come back at the end of the day you know radioactively glowing and my grandmother would say oh you all look so healthy um we used to go watch the sunset religiously like it was a broadway show we would go down early get our seats watch the sun go down and then for dinner we would either barbecue out back or we would go for fried clams soft serve ice cream we'd play miniature golf um my father used to wake us up twice in the middle of the night the first time he would take us down to the beach in our pajamas so we could see the stars and the second time he would light the candles in the dining room and we would play Midnight Uno. Uh, it was a very idyllic way to grow up by anyone's standards. And the November after my 16th summer, my father was killed in a plane crash and those summers came to an end. And my 17th summer, I spent working at a factory that made Halloween costumes. And as you know, it was 1986. So for eight hours a day, I was folding Rambo headbands and stapling clown hats to cardboard forms and assembling ghoul kits, which was like the glow in the dark teeth and the fake blood. And as I was doing this sort of bemoaning my reversal of fortune, I said to myself, I don't know what I'm gonna do with my life, but I'm gonna find a way to spend every summer at the beach. So in 1987, I attended the Johns Hopkins University and I was a writing seminars major. And my roommate, my freshman year was a biomedical engineer and I had a lot of friends that were in IR and everybody's classes were harder than mine were. And so my job all through college was to go across the street to PJs and save seats at the bar. That was my job. 
Um, I used to study in the reserve room at the Eisenhower Library with my friends, and then I would be finished first, and off I would go um, to save the ever so precious seats. And at the end of my four years, uh, I had a conversation with my professor, Madison Smart Bell, in the writing seminars department. And I said to, to him, you know, I want to be a writer. What do I do? Do I go to graduate school? Do I get a job? And he said to me, Ellen, you have to go out in the world and live so that you have experiences that then you can write about. So I moved after graduation, I moved to Manhattan and I got a job in publishing for about nine months, which I hated, but I thought, oh, books, publishing, two things have nothing to do with each other. Um, and then I got a job teaching in the New York City public schools which was very tough. Um, and I wasn't, I didn't come out of Hopkins um, certified to teach. I had to go to Queens College for an entire year to get certified. Um, and, but I taught one year in the public schools and then I got a better job teaching in, at Dobbs Ferry Middle School in Westchester County. And I lived in Manhattan and I would commute backwards um, and I taught. And the summer between those two years, uh, I decided I was gonna go to the beach. So I had grown up summers um, on Cape Cod and I had been to the vineyard um, during my college years. And so the last sort of point on the triangle was Nantucket. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna try Nantucket. So, you know, it's 1993. So I called information, got the number for the local paper, asked them to send me the classified ads, which then came in the mail. And I got a room in a house um, on Nantucket for the summer and I bought a 10 speed bike and I, I had the best summer of my entire life. Uh, when the ferry pulled in to the harbor, I can remember sort of paraphrasing John Denver. It was like coming home to a place I'd never been before. I fell madly in love with it. So I had this sort of idyllic summer. I went back and I taught in Dobbs Ferry. And then after that school year, I moved to Nantucket permanently. And that was in 1994. And in the, I would work, uh, you know, I had a bunch of <laughs> funny jobs um, on Nantucket for the summer. And then in the off season, I would travel. So the first year I went to Southeast Asia, um, Nepal. Um, I tried climbing to the Mount Everest base camp. Uh, I got very sick and got carried out by my Sherpa guide. That's another story. Um, all through Bali, Australia, New Zealand, Fiji. And then the second year, uh, the second off season, I went to South America, the Galapagos, Costa Rica. And then feeling like I had sufficiently gone out and lived, uh, I applied to graduate school. And I was accepted at the University of Iowa Writers Workshop, which as some of you probably know, is the best writing school in the country. And so off I go to Iowa from Nantucket and I get there and I am completely miserable. I absolutely hate it. Um, Nantucket is very fancy and has gorgeous restaurants and is beautiful, aesthetically pleasing. And I get to uh, Iowa City and it's like cornfields and pig farms and I mean, great college football, but there are no restaurants and I'm, I'm miserable. And they, the university has free therapy. So every week I go to therapy and I cry and I say how much I hate it and want to go home. And then eventually I realized that I could create my own therapy and I started writing a novel that was set on Nantucket and that novel became The Beach Club. So in my very last workshop, my second year at Iowa, uh, my professor had his agent in the class and the agent said, which one of you lives on Nantucket? And I said, oh, that's me. And he said, please stay and see me after class. And I did not even want to do that because my U-Haul was packed. I was ready to get the heck out of Dodge. Uh, but thankfully I did. His name was Michael Carlisle. Um, he grew up summers on Nantucket and sort of understood the world. And he has been my agent for 20 years, which is highly unusual and rare in the world of publishing. He's been my agent for 20 years. So that was in May of 1998. And in January of 99, I finished the Beach Club and I sent it off to Michael, at which means I printed it out, put it in a box and mailed it. And he called me and he said, I love your book. I'd like to represent you and I'm going to make you lots and lots of money. So of course I was thrilled. Who would not be thrilled to hear this? And um, he sent it off to the 13 publishers in New York. 
and 12 publishers said, no, no, thank you. And one publisher said, yes, it was St. Martin's Press, and they offered an advance of $5,000. And I said, is $5,000 a lot of money? Because I, I can't quit my job. And he's like, well, that is the offer we have. <laughs> that is the offer we're going to take. So in the summer of 2000, the Beach Club was published for $5,000. And it had been out just a week, I think, and it was picked as People Magazine's Beach Book of the Week. And immediately, St. Martin's ran out of copies. So you have to understand, it's the year 2000. Downloading it on your Kindle doesn't exist. If you want a book in 2000, you have to go to the store and buy it. Um, and so they were out of copies for three weeks. It was very frustrating. But it sold well for a first novel. And I was given a contract for two more books, which was Nantucket Nights and Summer People. And Nantucket Nights didn't sell quite as well. Um, it wasn't a first novel. It didn't get a People magazine review. And then Summer People sold even worse. Um, however, they gave me another two book deal for The Blue Bistro and The Love Season. And The Blue Bistro, until recently, was my very, very favorite book. It has all this food and wine in it. It has this great love triangle. I love The Blue Bistro. And it sold abominably. It sold like 4,000 copies in hardback, which is not very many. And I was devastated. And so at that point, I decided I had to do something. So I spent $10,000 of my own money and I got a publicist for the love season, a private publicist. And the publicist did a tremendous job. Again, People Magazine, again, four stars with the picture, the great, you can't ask for better publicity than that. And um, again, St. Martin's Press ran out of books in the middle of summer. Again, it's 2006, downloading it on your Nook or reading it on your iPhone doesn't exist. You have to go to the store. Um, so at that point I was at a crossroads and I was sitting on a novel called Barefoot. And my agent, same agent, Michael, said, I think we have to shop this novel around. But I didn't want to because I had Stockholm Syndrome and I was in love with my captor and did not want to leave my publisher. Um, but he convinced me. And in September of 2006, uh, I had what I call my Cinderella Day in New York City. And we went, at that point, there were 10 publishers in New York. We went to all 10 publishers. They all wanted to buy Barefoot, and I ended up switching publishers to Little Brown, Hachette, and they have turned the last 19 of my books into New York Times bestsellers, including this past summer, Summer of 69, debuted at number one on the New York Times bestseller list the week it came out. So, I mean, dream come true, you guys. I could not even believe it, but they built me book by book, summer by summer, year by year to get me to the top. It was not an overnight success by any means. Um, I do have two very happy codas to this story. Um, the first happy coda is that in 2011, I was in Cooperstown, New York with my oldest child, my son Max, and he was playing baseball there. And Michael, my agent, same agent, calls and says, you are not gonna believe this, but the Blue Bistro hit the New York Times bestseller list six years after it was published, which is just, it never, that never happens, but it had written Silver Girl that year. It wrote the success of Silver Girl. And the second happy coda is that I have found a way to spend every summer at the beach. Yay. Um, so I just want to segue quickly and talk a little bit about my new favorite book, which is my, the book that is coming out this summer, which is called 28 Summers. It is based on the play movie slash movie same time next year. And it's about a couple who meet on Nantucket in 1993 and proceed to meet for the next 27 summers. It's the first novel that I have actively used Johns Hopkins in the storyline. So uh, my two characters are Mallory Blessing and Jake McLeod. And Mallory is from Baltimore. She grew up in Roland Park, and her brother, Cooper, goes to Hopkins, and he's a Fiji, Phi Gamma Delta, and he, his big brother in his fraternity is Jake McLeod, and the summer that uh, Mallory's living on the Untucket, Cooper's getting married, he has a bachelor weekend, all these things happen, it ends up that it's just Mallory and Jake at the end 
uh, of the weekend together and there's a spark and they end up meeting every Labor Day weekend for the next 27 summers. But there are a lot of really good Baltimore references. There's a scene at PJ's, RIP PJ's, I love you. And um, so I think for Hopkins people, it'll be especially fun to read it. Okay, we're taking questions. Jamie, are you there? I'm here and I sent you some questions and I just wanted to share, you have um, quite a few fans on. Um, we have, uh, I wanted to share, um, you have Jennifer Sharp. She says, yay, Hi. class of 1991. Hi, that's so fun. Hi, Jen. And um, Ephraim Epstein, he said awesome. he was a year ahead of you at Hopkins and you yeah. had some mutual friends. Awesome. I love and, that. And his mom read it as well. And they love the shout out to Savinor since we oh, know yeah. the grandson of one of the founders. Okay, wonderful. That was in summer of 69. Savinor's is, Savinor's is a specialty food store on Charles Street in Boston. And the person that made it famous is Julia Child. So very oh, good wow. there. And then she's, he says, I know you wrote a digital mini sequel for the book. Is there any one of those of us uh, not yet on the Kindle that can read. I'm not sure what that means. Okay, so uh, last summer's novel was Summer of 69. And one of the things I did this winter, I mean, I don't even know how I found the time, is I wrote a chapter that is the sequel to Summer of 69, and it's called Summer of 79. And it's only available for a very short while longer. I think it is tricky to get it on Amazon. Uh, it's only available in e-form. This is all like, it's too complicated to get into here, but for whatever reason, it's only available. This chapter, 61 pages, is a sequel to Summer of 69, Summer of 79. It's fantastic if I do say so myself, and it can only be gotten electronically. You can read it on your phone um, if you go through i iBooks, um, and there is a way, I think, to get it on your on your Kindle, but Honestly, it's beyond me. Somebody, you guys are smart Hopkins people. And you figure it out. I, you know, so. Well, so I'll move on to some of the questions I shared with you prior that I received from people who are now on the call. Um, so a lot of people are curious, what is your creative process? Do you follow a strict, a strict schedule or is it more organic? Uh, I would say both. So the number one thing about my work life is I'm super duper disciplined like ridiculously disciplined. That said, I do not actually have a schedule that I follow. Um, other than I, I work every single day. The quarantine for me is perfect. It's just sort of how I do things anyway. I stay home by myself and I do my work. Um, I write longhand notebooks. So right now, I don't know if you can see my background. I am not on Nantucket. I am in St. John. Some of you know that I've written a trilogy set here in St. John. I normally come March, April for five weeks. I've been here for seven weeks because I got stuck. I am going <laughs> supposed to go home on Sunday. Let's hope. Um, but I will work. So, uh, you know, I get up in the morning and I go running and, and then I get, I get to work and I can, because I write notebooks, I can work at the beach. I can work at the pool. Um, and, while I've been here, I've been finishing the third book in that trilogy. I'm going to take one week off when I go home, unpack my things, spend time with my kids, and then I'm going to start writing the book for summer of 2021. And then in addition, I'm going to be promoting the summer's book. So I'm always doing sort of three jobs, which is hard, but I'm very, very disciplined. I do not have an assistant. Everything is done myself. So I write the books longhand. I type them into the computer. I do not have a schedule, but I'm always working. That is my, that is very impressive. Um, does it, how long does it take to write a book? Is there sort of a timeline or? Yeah. So I, start, the book? yeah, I start the winter books, which I've written now seven, and this will be the last one, but the winter books, uh, take four months. I start them January and they're due at the end of April where we are now. And then the summer books take eight months. So, I'll start May 1st and I will hand it in 
I'll hand it in at the end of October, beginning of November. And then I do six to eight weeks of revisions, November, December. Um, when I'm, re and the summer books are more complex and, you know, they're not series. The thing about writing a series is the first book is, tr is generally harder because you got to start with the characters and everything. Then books two and three, and in the case of my holiday series, book four, they roll along because you already have the characters. Um, but the summer books are start from scratch. They're standalone. So you're, you're reinventing the wheel every single time. So those take, those take longer. Um, anyway, when I revise them in November, December, I go to Boston. I have a little apartment in Beacon Hill and I am a hermit for November and half of December. Um, sometimes the revisions are really tough. I have missed Christmas, I think twice. So <laughs> my kids, my poor kids, that's all I can say very patient. Well, that was one question I, I had, we had is, do your children read your books? And if so, what do they think? So if I have any parents of teenagers out there, you will appreciate, I'm not sure the boys can read. They are 20 and 18 and I, I'm kidding. They can read. Uh, they have not and probably will never, or maybe, I don't know. They do not read my books. Uh, my daughter is 14. She's she will probably read them. She's too cool to read them right now um, and has better things to do. But I, she, she's a reader and a writer herself. And um, I think may in fact end up being a novelist herself. And so I think at some point she probably will read them. That's awesome. So how you have um, great names for your characters. How do you name your characters? Well, it's tricky at this point because I'm just finishing my 26th book and <laughs> they're very, you know, they're populated books. So um, I need a lot of names. And uh, I see about 10,000 women per year when, when I'm traveling. So a lot of times I'll, if I hear a really cool name, I'll put it on a piece of paper and stick it aside. Um, but I'm, I keep a collection of names in my phone it's not only first names, I have to come up with last names. And you need things that are distinctive, that people are going to remember, but that aren't too weird. Uh, my editor was getting very fed up with me in 28 Summer. She's like, you have to stop with the weird names. Just some minor characters had really strange names. And she's like, you, you got to stop, Ellen. Just give them normal names. But it, it is definitely becoming a challenge. Right, because you've written so many books and used so many great names. It's got to be hard. It's hard. And like your main characters have to have cool names so that people remember who they are. I mean, you can't, can't really use Jack and Jill. You know, you have, to, you have to go beyond that. That's true. That's true. Now, um, you seem very, very busy, but do you have time to read? And if so, who do you read? Yeah, so I read all the time. Reading is something that I consider to be my job. So for example, like when I have a work day, which is every day, but today, like today I went to the beach with my notebook and I take my no the novel that I'm reading as well. Um, and I'm, I'm really nerdy. It's like a Hopkins thing. Like I'm very nerdy. Like I, I read off a list that I keep in my phone. I do not deviate. I read until I'm finished with it. And one of the things I've started doing um, is posting on my Instagram. So for those of you who don't follow me on Instagram, you definitely should, because I put a lot of really good book recommendations up, things that I love. Um, and I'm, I'm not the only writer that does it, but I, I've, been, it's, I've been called out for being particularly generous, which makes me laugh, because we can all read more than one book. Um, but, you know, novelists are competitive, I guess. And, um, I am very, very keen to promote other people's books. In fact, I would love when I retire to become a book influencer. You know, I love Reese Witherspoon and Sarah Jessica Parker, but they are not writers. And I feel like the number one book influencer in the country should be a writer and it should be me. And if I have my way, it will be someday. I have no doubt that that will <laughs> that you will make that happen. You seem very determined and very driven and very focused. I mean, the fact that you write books longhand in a notebook is in and of itself very impressive. Um, lots of dedication. Now, do you have any writing quirks? Well, I mean, I think that's probably the biggest quirk. I mean, nobody writes longhand uh, anymore. 
Um, that is definitely my, my thing. Um, I, I have like these funny, I also like, I can block absolutely anything out. So when my kids were just a little bit younger, like when my son, my sons are both athletes. And when they were in high school, um, when my oldest son was in high school, you know, he pitched uh, for the baseball team and he played varsity basketball. And I would take my notebooks to his games. Basketball, it was pretty, there was a lot of action. His baseball games were so boring. <laughs> and, and also Nantucket doesn't really have a spring. So it would be like 40 degrees and raining. And uh, you could, I could pull my Jeep up to the backstop while he was pitching. And I would have my notebook sitting on the steering wheel and I could watch him pitch and then write and watch him pitch and then, you know, write the novel during the baseball game. That's a, that's a, some serious multitasking, but I hear you on the baseball, not the most oh. active sport. <laughs> Here. Now, how do you get the ideas for all of your books? Like what, how does it start? What plants the seed and how does it grow? Um, it really varies. Different things. Some of them are thematic. So let's say, oh, when, when the Beach Club came out, the Beach Club was my first novel. It's about a hotel on Nantucket. And when that came out, I was out to dinner at a restaurant called The Pearl and the owner of The Pearl came out and she said, we all read the book and we loved it, but we decided you could never write a novel about a restaurant because it would be too scandalous. So no sooner does she say this than I'm like, okay, obviously I need to start planning my restaurant book. So the Blue <laughs> Pro was my, was my restaurant book. And, you know, I had a, I wanted to do a Nantucket wedding book, which was Beautiful Day. And I wanted to do a murder mystery, which was The Perfect Couple. And I wanted to do a historical novel, which was Summer of 69. Um, and then other times, for example, Silver Girl, it was really something situational that struck me. So the origins of my novel Silver Girl came with a newspaper article, the New York Times in April of 2009. There was an article about Ruth Madoff in the living section and it talked about how since Bernie had gone to jail, she couldn't get her hair colored, she couldn't order flowers, she couldn't go out um, to dinner at the restaurant where they'd eaten every night for eight years. I mean, it was her own personal quarantine essentially, but she was just absolutely um, a pariah and couldn't go anywhere. And, and I found that somewhat interesting, but at the end of the article, it said that she had a friend from preschool who had stood by her side. And I thought to myself, that's the novel. The novel is the friend. Who is she? And so Silver Girl is about a woman named Meredith Delin, and she's basically a Ruth Madoff character and she goes to Nantucket to stay and hide with her best friend from growing up. And it's really a novel about their, about their friendship. That's great. So it's really nice that, you know, current events can inspire because sometimes, yeah. you know, truth is stranger <laughs> than fiction. Um, I, uh, I have some questions from the, uh, the crowd. Um, are you, uh, let me see, what do you think of self-publishing? Uh, it's a tricky question. <laughs> it is. I, I'm, I, I'm going to be honest. I'm wary of self-publishing. It really depends what you're after. If you're after merely just holding your own book and seeing it, then self-publishing will work. Um, but if you want to sell books and an audience, then I, you, you really have to wait until you need an agent first. Absolutely, you need an agent. And then you need, uh, you don't need a main mainstream publisher, but you need a publisher um, of, of some kind. Amazon is now starting to do some publishing um, I haven't actually read any Amazon published books, I don't think, but you know what? They're doing okay in the movie department. So, and fantastically in this TV series, so we can't count them out, right? That might be fine. But I, I think self-publishing is, is so tricky. And I, I feel like if you have a project and you want to self-publish it, um, and you don't care about anybody but your own self, then I think it's great. That's great. That's great information. Thank you. Now, what advice would you give to somebody suffering from, let's say, either a lack of motivation or 
that dreaded writer's block. Yeah, it's hard. It's real. And it's hard because I talk to so many people and they have, you know, three chapters of something in a drawer. Um, I was not the most talented person at Iowa, not by a long shot. The best writers I ever knew were at Iowa and a lot of them could not finish anything. And that was what set me apart is that I could finish. And then once you finish, you can go back and make it better. Um, I think it's really, it, it is 1%, what did they say? It's 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration. And that is definitely true for me. Um, it is all about hard work. So I always say the, the way to succeed is to start at the beginning and move to the end and just do not get derailed by what I call the nebulous middle. You can always go back and fix it, but it is a start to finish process if you want to get anything done. That's great advice. So what advice would you give while we're on the topic of advice to aspiring writers? Like what would you have told yourself looking back? What do you um, know now that you could have known then that would have helped? I feel like I, I published my first book and I had no, I mean, there's no way you can have any concept of the scope of what you're capable of. If you told me with book one, you're going to, you know, 20 years from now, you're going to be writing, you're finishing your 26th book. I would have said you were nuts um, because I live so fully in each book and I was very, very vested in my first novel and almost probably too vested. I can remember what I told you about how they ran out of copies. I was devastated. I mean, I thought it was the end of the world. And um, so I guess my advice is if, if, you, if you have, and this sort of ties into the self-publishing thing too. If you have a book, and you're desperate to get it published and you can't get it published, my honest advice is to write a second book because that, just keep going um, and don't get stuck on one project. Well, that's, that's very good advice. I hope there are a lot of aspiring writers on this call. I hope there are a lot of writing STEM students on this call and I hope we all take uh, that advice. Um, so lastly, I want to ask one more question. What's next for you? Um, what does the future hold? I know we have more books coming up and publicity for those exciting books, especially 28 Summers. I hope everybody orders it. Yes. Um, well, I mean, I, you know, one area I have not yet conquered is TV slash movies. I'll tell you what, it's hard. So for anybody out there who thinks it's hard, to write a book, I feel you because I have been trying, you know, for 20 years to get one of my books made into um, a show. Um, it used to be the movies, then it was a series. Now I'm like, I'll take anything. Um, and sort of the trajectory of, of how it's gone for me so far is finally in 2018, I had, uh, I formed a partnership with a couple named the Jacques Matones who wrote and produced Mad Men and Amblin, which is Steven Spielberg's production company. And we had a script for my novel, The Identicals. And we went out to Hollywood and we pitched it to everybody and we had four offers and it ended up going to Hulu. And I was so excited. And then, you know, the script sat and sat and then Hulu eventually said, we're, we're not going to make this. I mean, like a year later. So, that was very disappointing because I was so excited to have that turned into a show. Okay, that didn't happen. Then the perfect couple got picked up by a company called Sidecar Entertainment. They were slated to sell it to Fox. Fox was all excited about it. And then I found out, I don't know, three or four weeks ago that Fox had another show set on the vineyard. They were going to take that show instead. So now The Perfect Couple, although it has a fantastic script, is going to be repackaged and sent elsewhere. So it may, in fact, it, The Perfect Couple may, in fact, go to a different network. Fine. You know, 28 Summers has got a little bit of action on it, which I cannot talk about because it's not final. My Christmas series has a shopping agreement, which means somebody, I have producers that are trying to make it. It, it is so hard and it's so hard to remain optimistic. And yet at the same time, I need to follow my own advice and just say, just hang in there. 
keep going. I just finished the St. John series. That could go. Um, it would be very ironic if the St. John series sold before all the Nantucket books, but it could. Um, but you just have to, you have to be patient and you have to be optimistic and not get discouraged. And there's, you know, in some sense it's out of my control. And uh, all I can do is hope and pray, which I will do. I think that's good advice for all of us right now to hope and pray and stay <laughs> optimistic. And I think that's just a good note to end on. Uh, if you have anything else to share with us, let us know. Otherwise, I really want to encourage everyone to pre-order 28 Summers because we're going to read about Hopkins in it. Yes, we are. It's going to be so exciting. I want to thank everybody who joined me, especially my people from 87 to 91, etc. cetera. And, um, and thank you, Jamie, for having me. And everybody stay safe. Wear your masks. I don't need to wear a mask because I'm living alone right now, but I'm going to go home on Sunday and just please be careful out there and, and go Hopkins. Thank you again and stay safe, travel safe. And I'm so excited to read your next book and next books. Thank you again for being with us. Thanks, Jamie. Bye-bye.